Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Catholicism, a podcast about Catholic teaching and why it makes sense. I'm your host, Caitlin West. Alrighty, episode two, here we go. So, in the last episode, we talked about the idea of faith, yeah, kind of broadly, what is faith? And now in this episode, we're going to sort of think about, okay, so there's faith. I need to have faith. But what do I have faith in? Yeah, like where do I direct my faith? So this episode is going to be all about the existence of God. And we're going to be taking our points from section one, chapter one of the catechism. Now, section one begins with this idea that the human person is kind of inherently oriented towards God. So point number 27 of the catechism says the desire for God is written in the human heart because man has been created by God and for God. Now, you might hear that and sort of think, well, you know, (laughs) I don't have a particular desire for God in my heart or like I've got this friend and she's a raging atheist and she's perfectly happy living without God. Like she doesn't desire God. And yeah, okay, totally. You might not have kind of an explicit sense of I am seeking God, especially not the idea of God as like an old man in the sky with a white beard or, you know, a particular faith or religion. But, but that does not mean that we don't desire God on some level. So let's strip it back to something a bit more basic and see if it makes sense. What do we mean when we say God? Do we mean an old man in the sky? No. (laughs) Okay. What we mean is being itself. Yeah. Truth itself. Love itself. The source and the fullness of all existence. So I might struggle with the idea that I have a desire for God in my heart, But it might be easier to accept that I have a desire for truth itself and love and beauty in my heart. And not just truth and love and beauty in a kind of little everyday sort of pedestrian way, right? Like there are certain things that are true, like one plus one equals two. That is true. That is a truth. But that doesn't satisfy my desire for truth. Rather, we seek answers to the big questions in life. Questions like, what is the purpose of my life? Why am I alive? Right? Like that's the, que- that is the question. Yeah. Just ask Shakespeare. Just ask old mate Hamlet. It's a whole soliloquy about it. And you know, okay. Maybe, maybe you don't sit around at home with like a pipe in your armchair thinking about the meaning of life, but maybe you turned 25 and had a quarter life crisis. Yeah. Or, you know, people who get to the peak of their career and they turn around and they're like, so what, what's the point? There's actually um, there's this short story writer that I really love called Ted Chang, and he's so much fun. I, I recommend reading his short stories. He writes this kind of speculative science fiction. And in one of his recent short stories, he writes about this kind of imaginary device, right, that basically the function of it is that it proves to the user that life is meaningless And in the short story, anyone who uses the device basically ends up like wasting away and dying because they can't cope with the idea that life is meaningless. And it's really interesting because Ted Chang is like, I don't think he's Christian at all. But in explaining this short story, he says that to him, this was the one idea that he felt could kill someone. (laughs) The idea that life is meaningless. All of this is just a long way around to saying that the human person inherently seeks ultimate truth and ultimate meaning. Another way that we see, you know, the imprint of this desire for God on our hearts is in our desire for love. And again, not just love in like a a little everyday way. We seek that ultimate transcendent love that will truly satisfy us and make us happy. And, you know, we can call to mind every Hollywood film we've ever seen or like any song on the radio. It's all about how, you know, there's just this one person and you're going to meet them and they're just going to completely satisfy you and they will love you exactly the way you are. They'll never let you down. And, you know, you talk to someone who's been in a relationship, especially long term, and they will tell you that that is absolutely not how that works. No one person can love us in that way. And yet we still desire that love. So there's this idea that was first defended by St. Thomas Aquinas. 
And it also appears in C.S. Lewis's memoir called Surprised by Joy. It's basically the argument that every single desire of the human person can be satisfied by something. We don't desire things that don't exist. Yeah. So we feel hunger because there is food. And we feel thirst because there is water. In the same way, we desire love and we desire truth and ultimate meaning. And we ask those questions like, why am I alive? What's the point of my existence? Because there is an answer to that question, because there is a love that can satisfy us. So that argument is called the argument from desire, if you want to check it out further. One other point that I want to make. I've heard people say before that, like, you know, To be honest, I just don't think that people have those desires in them anymore, especially young people, you know, people my age and younger. People actually don't seek truth itself and they're not seeking the big answers to big questions and they're not seeking some great love. They're total cynics about love, right? Young people just don't actually have those desires in them. And that's a great point. The response that I would give to that is that just because you have deadened your appetites that does not mean that you don't have them. Okay, let's illustrate this idea with a story, (laughs) my favorite. (laughs) Okay, so when I was 18, I had just moved out of home and just started at university and I was completely immature and I had no concept, well, (laughs) I did actually have a concept, I just chose to ignore it, of like basic nutrition, right? So I pretty much lived on sugar. (laughs) I just, like, I thought that a packet of jelly beans was an appropriate mid-morning snack. (laughs) So I was constantly snacking, right? And snacking on junk food. Now, I never felt hungry. I didn't get around feeling like I was malnourished because I was constantly eating. But once a year, I would go on a retreat. And oh my gosh, (laughs) those retreats were always so hard because suddenly my meals were timetabled and I couldn't just snack on sugar all day. And so I would get to lunchtime and I would be ravenous. Oh my gosh. And like that meal, it was like, oh man, food has never tasted so good. And I remember that feeling of just total satisfaction, right? Of eating like not just food, but good food, nutritious food. And I remember thinking like, oh man, I've really got to do something about my diet. And then I would like buy a hamburger on the way home. (laughs) But it's kind of the same with our spiritual appetites. If we're constantly snacking on junk food, we are not going to feel that hunger and we're going to deaden our desire for the true feast. So when it comes to truth, if I'm constantly snacking on information, I'm scrolling through social media, scrolling through news headlines and not actually reading the articles. I've always got my phone in front of me. I'm always Googling things, okay, every five seconds. Then I'm not going to feel that desire for transcendent ultimate truth, okay? And the same with love. Like if I have instant access to pornography, right? Or, or Tinder, I can just hook up with someone. Or even if I'm just like on 12 different group WhatsApps, yeah, and I'm constantly texting my friends and I'm on all forms of social media and I'm getting validated by likes and comments on social media, I'm going to lose that sense of my desire for love itself. And what I might be left with is just this kind of general feeling of malaise. And I remember that when I was like living off sugar, that I didn't feel great. I didn't feel good, but I didn't identify it as hunger. And so if we're feeling like that, or we know someone who feels like that, it might be worth inviting that person to just fast (laughs) for a while, you know, get off social media or like pick one newspaper and commit to reading the stories in it. So we all have an inherent desire for truth itself and love itself and goodness itself. Okay. And that's the definition of God. The next question is, how do we then find God? So the Catechism of the Catholic Church, again, in section one, chapter one, tells us that we come to know the existence of God via philosophical proofs using the world around us and the human person as two points for departure. Okay, (laughs) what do we mean by that? Right, let's unpack it. First of all, when we say philosophical proofs, we don't mean proof in the scientific sense, right? Like we can do an experiment and kind of conjure up God or measure God. What we mean by philosophical proofs is 
philosophically compelling arguments. And these philosophically compelling arguments begin with the world around us and the human person. So like, we don't just wander around and suddenly spontaneously go, I think there's a God. Okay, we begin with the things that we can see and touch and experience. And from that, we develop a belief in God. Now, What are these philosophical proofs, I hear you ask? Well, let me tell you, there are so many of them. Honestly, when I was doing my research for this episode, I was like, oh my Lord. Like at one point, I think I was on Edward Faith. No, it was um, Peter Kreeft's website. And I was like, oh my Lordy may. There are like 30 or something philosophical proofs for the existence of God. And they're all like incredibly detailed. So, okay, we don't have time to unpack every single philosophical proof much as I would like to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a summary taken from a book by William Lane Craig called Reasonable Faith. And William Lane Craig summarizes four key arguments for the existence of God. So these four key arguments are the ontological argument, the cosmological argument, the argument from design and the moral argument. So we're going to unpack those four arguments. So the first, the ontological argument, it goes like this. First of all, nothing greater than God can be conceived of. Okay, so we can't think of anything greater than God because that's literally the definition of God. Secondly, it is greater for something to exist in reality than just in the mind, right? So what, what's greater, an orange or the idea of an orange? Thirdly, if God did not exist in reality, then we would be able to conceive of something greater than God, i.e. a God who exists in reality, right? Therefore, God must exist in reality. So this argument was first defended by St. Anselm in the 11th century and is still taken seriously by a lot of people today. However, it tends to kind of be looked down on a little bit, especially by skeptics. And I can see why, because something about it sort of sounds like just clever rhetoric, you know, like, you know, when you're in an argument with someone and you're like, okay, technically you've won this argument, but you haven't convinced me. (laughs) Okay. And I think a lot of people feel like this when they hear this argument, but, but it is an argument that is taken seriously and has been defended by contemporary philosophers. So it might be something that you want to look into more. Okay, so that's the ontological argument. The second argument is the cosmological argument for the existence of God. And I love I love these arguments and they're among the most popular arguments for the existence of God. So the cosmological arguments basically start with the idea that stuff exists, right? And then based on the stuff that we can see, we argue backwards from that stuff to a first cause, okay, something that must have ultimately created all of that stuff. So the most popular of these cosmological arguments are St. Thomas Aquinas's five ways. And you might have encountered these arguments before, especially if you've looked into the existence of God. Now, we don't have time to go through all of the five ways. So what I'm going to do is just briefly unpack one of them. So Aquinas's first way is the argument from motion. And it basically goes like this. Everything that exists is in a state of motion. Now, by that, we don't mean that it's moving around. Yeah, like we're obviously we're not all running around and nothing is still. Okay, there are obviously some things that are physically static. What Aquinas means by motion is that everything is in a state of change. Yeah, so, you know, as a human person, I go from being an embryo to a newborn to a child to an adult and then I get old and die, right? Now, Every change that occurs in existence is prompted by something external to that thing. So example, say that there's like a piece of sandstone sitting on a beach and over time the sandstone wears away and it becomes sand. Now that change is prompted by wind and rain and gravity, all of these external factors that turn the sandstone from stone into sand. So nothing just spontaneously changes itself. Okay, now if we zoomed out and looked at all of existence, we might be able to kind of see it as this seemingly endless series of changes. And we might look at that and sort of think, okay, so what? Like, why can't we just have an endless series of changes? What's wrong with that? Let's think of it this way. 
I don't know if you've ever encountered the music videos of a band called OK Go. (laughs) They're this band that kind of became famous for creating these really wacky, amazing music videos. I I encourage you to go down that YouTube rabbit hole because it's fantastic. So one of their earliest videos features this machine, right, that was made by a bunch of engineers. And it starts with like a set of dominoes falling over. And then those dominoes hit something else. And then that thing hits something else and sets that off. And then eventually it gets bigger. The chain reaction gets bigger and bigger until you have like televisions flying through the air and people getting splattered by paint bombs and it just goes crazy. It's fantastic. Now let's imagine that that machine just kept going on and on and on. And maybe those changes kind of branched off in different directions until you had this ever expanding kind of series of chain reactions, right? Now, if I walked into the room and I saw that machine going, I wouldn't just think, oh, okay, well, this is clearly just an endless series of changes caused by nothing. Like this machine doesn't require an explanation because it's clearly just infinite. Those changes might be able to continue ad infinitum, but they need to have started somewhere, okay? And that would be immediately clear if I walked into a room with, you know, all of these chain reactions going off. I'd be like, whoa, who started that? And actually in the music video, it's really cool. At the very beginning, this hand comes on with a little toy car and it hits the first domino, right? And starts the machine off. And I love that image of a hand entering the picture because that's kind of like existence, Now, the thing that started off that chain reaction has to have been something that is external to the machine. Why? Because if it was part of the machine, then it would be part of the machine and the machine would still not have an explanation and there would still have to be something outside the machine that set it off. Okay. In other words, when it comes to existence, what is required is what we call an unmoved mover something that just exists per se, that doesn't change itself and doesn't require anything else to set it in motion because it it is existence itself. Okay. That's what we mean by God. Now I want to be clear that I'm not arguing that existence is just like a machine. Okay. Because that brings up a whole bunch of other problems. What I am arguing is that a seemingly infinite series of changes had to start somewhere. Okay, so that's one example of a cosmological argument for the existence of God. Now let's move on to the third argument, the argument from design. So the argument from design is basically this idea that when we look at the world around us, we look at how complex and how beautiful and ordered and finely tuned it is, And we think, okay, this has to have been designed by an intelligent mind. It's not just an accident. It's not just a random accumulation of matter. Now, this is the argument that often people will do without even realizing that they're doing philosophy, right? Like you might just go for a walk in the bush or see an incredible sunset or, you know, be holding a newborn and just think, oh my gosh, this has to have been intelligently designed. This isn't just random. So if you want to think more about the argument from design, you might look into things like the fine tuning of the universe, right? Like, oh my gosh, talk about rabbit holes to go down. That is amazing. When you look at how intricate and how complex and ordered this universe is, it's actually pretty astounding. For a long time, I've been obsessed with this YouTube channel called Special Books by Special Kids. It's basically this guy who goes around interviewing people with different disabilities. And one of the things that I find really interesting is that often when people are explaining their diagnoses, they'll say things like, you know, oh, I just have this one tiny little protein or, or, or genetic mutation or, or something. This one tiny, tiny, minuscule thing went wrong when I was in utero and that has radiated through my whole life, Right. Like the fact when we think about it, the fact that any of us is born with everything kind of functioning typically is a miracle. Like it it really is. And some people might say, well, okay, what about those people with disabilities? Isn't that a sign that there isn't a God, that things have gone wrong in creation? And to me, that's like pointing out a flaw in a Da Vinci artwork and being like, well, clearly this wasn't painted by a human because, because something went wrong in this painting. No. Okay. The things that go wrong in creation, that is a question we need to answer. And we will discuss it when we look at the problem of suffering. But 
the fact that anything goes right at all, you know, creation itself is a masterpiece. And think about it. When we see something in the world that is ordered and beautiful and complex, we automatically assume that there is an intelligent mind behind it. So for instance, I remember when I was a teenager watching a a documentary with my dad on this guy called Andy Goldsworthy. And if you haven't heard of him, I recommend looking up his stuff. He's amazing. He's this artist that basically goes out into nature and just uses the natural world to create these incredible artworks. And I remember I was watching this documentary with my dad and my dad turned to me and was like, what would you do if you came across one of these artworks when you were like out walking? Like, what would you think? And I was like, mom, well, I guess I would sort of think like who made that, who put it there. And dad was like, yeah, exactly. And that's just something that's not even that complex. Like it's just a bunch of leaves that have been arranged in a way that is so clearly ordered that it's obviously deliberate. One other point that I want to make, I've encountered people in my own life who basically have this attitude that if you're not kind of whipping out the big names of philosophy, right, or unpacking complex philosophical arguments, and that if your belief in God kind of stems from your encounters with nature or raising a child or something, that that's somehow a kind of an inferior way of coming to believe in the existence of God. And I would just encourage you to not take that position seriously (laughs) because, okay, maybe we shouldn't treat our experience of nature as an endpoint, right? Like, you know, I I don't need to think any further because I saw a beautiful sunset or I held a baby or something. (laughs) No, of course, engage with philosophy. But at the same time, I don't think people should feel like their belief in God is invalid or inferior because it's not kind of highly technical and academic. I mean, there are highly technical and academic arguments for the existence of God based on intelligent design. And I think it is important that we engage more deeply with philosophy, you know, in whatever way we are able to. But at the same time, you know, God has left his fingerprints on nature. And it's perfectly valid to see those fingerprints and deduce that they belong to God. So that's the argument from design. Now, the fourth and final argument that William Lane Craig summarizes is the argument from morality. Now, this argument is where both G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis begin their books on the existence of God. So for G.K. Chesterton in orthodoxy and C.S. Lewis in mere Christianity. And I'm actually going to turn to C.S. Lewis here because he explains the argument for morality in such a typically kind of eloquent and engaging way. Okay, so this is chapter one of Mere Christianity. Everyone has heard people quarreling. I believe we can learn something very important from listening to the kinds of things they say. They say things like this. How would you like it if anyone did the same to you? That's my seat. I was there first. Leave him alone. He isn't doing you any harm. Why should you shove in first? Give me a bit of your orange. I gave you a bit of mine. Come on, you promised. People say things like that every day. Educated people as well as uneducated and children as well as grown-ups. Now, what interests me about all these remarks is that the man who makes them is not merely saying that the other man's behavior does not happen to please him. He is appealing to some kind of standard of behavior, which he expects the other man to know about. And the other man very seldom replies to hell with your standard. Nearly always he tries to make out that what he has been doing does not really go against the standard, or that if it does, there is some special excuse. He pretends there is some special reason in this particular case why the person who took the seat first should not keep it, or that things were quite different when he was given the bit of orange, or that something has turned up which lets him off keeping his promise. It looks, in fact, very much as if both parties had in mind some kind of law or rule of fair play or decent behaviour or morality or whatever you like to call it about which they really agreed. And they have. Okay, so that was kind of a long chunk, but basically what C.S. Lewis is getting at is that there are some things that are right or wrong 
no matter what the circumstances are. Now, you might hear that and sort of be like, well, I don't know, Caitlin. I mean, there are a lot of relativists out there these days, you know, a lot of people who don't believe in objective morality. And look, I am here to tell you that there is not one actual relativist in the world, okay? Relativism is an impossible position. If you think you're a relativist, you're wrong, okay? Let me tell you why. First of all, because it's a self-refuting claim, okay? As soon as I say there is no objective truth, I have asserted that as an objective truth. Secondly... You know, if you know someone who considers themselves to be a relativist or you consider yourself to be a relativist, I would invite you to kind of push against the limits of that and try to find where they are, because I can guarantee to you that there will be a point at which you you say, okay, no, that is wrong. Doesn't matter what the circumstances are. So I remember having this conversation with a good friend of mine who considers himself a relativist. And I was sort of asking him about, oh, what about this? What about this? And basically, we got to a point in the conversation where he had to defend the idea that in some circumstances, it was morally permissible to rape someone, Okay, which is ridiculous, right? So for every person, whatever that limit is, it will exist. If you push hard enough, you'll find that limit. Okay, so why does it matter, this idea that there is objective morality? Well, because as soon as you accept that there are truths that are not dictated by social constructs, okay, that transcend them, that's like a first step on the path to God. As well as this, and this is a point that William Lane Craig makes, this is an idea that began with Plato, that when we say that something is good or bad, we are comparing it to some kind of ultimate ideal of good or bad. We're placing it on a scale at the ends of which are ultimate good and ultimate evil. And what do we mean when we say ultimate good? We mean God. Okay, so those are kind of the four key proofs for the existence of God. If you want to read up on any of those further, I would suggest looking at someone like Edward Faser, spelled F-E-S-E-R, or Peter Kraft, or even checking out one of the many YouTube videos that are around at the moment. It seems to be a really popular thing, these debates about the existence of God. Some of those debates are really, really good and really useful. So you could check out channels like Pints with Aquinas or Capturing Christianity. Okay, one final point that I want to make before we wrap up is that I think it's important to, well, I think it's important to note the catechism makes note of this, right? Point number 40 of the catechism reminds us that our knowledge of God is limited and our language about God is also limited. And this makes sense, right? Because we can only understand and talk about God in reference to his created world. And his created world is not God. Okay, so the analogies and images and words that we come up with to describe God will never fully capture God. And we touched on this in the last episode, right? That we can't fit the ocean inside a bucket. But it's important to remember that, okay, maybe the ocean doesn't fit in a bucket, but that doesn't mean that we can't dive into the ocean, yeah? That's the beautiful thing about these mysteries, is that we can dive in and spend our whole lives, if we want to, playing in that ocean and learning more and diving deeper into those mysteries. But ultimately, we can only know so much about God through philosophy. At some point, God himself actually has to reveal himself to us. And this makes total sense, right? Because God isn't just a set of facts, yeah? He's not just an idea. He's he's a being. He is being itself. He's three persons in one being. And just like with any person, we can't know them fully until they reveal themselves to us. So, okay, example. Let's say that you were completely obsessed with a particular celebrity, right? And you knew everything about them. You'd read their Wikipedia page a hundred times. You followed them on social media. You watched all the YouTube videos that they were in. You're just a super fan. And then one day you find out that that celebrity is going to be in your city. And you're like, oh my gosh, okay, this is my time. This is my moment. And you run to him and you're like, oh my gosh, Tom Hiddleston. I, I really love you so much. And I think that we're soulmates and we're meant to be together and he turns to you and he's like mate you don't know me (laughs) and that would be 
not only a fair enough thing to say, it's the obvious thing to say, because it doesn't matter how much we know about someone until they reveal their inner world to us. We can't truly know them. And this is something that we are going to explore in the next episode. Oh, my gosh. Cliffhanger. (laughs) I bet you're listening to this being like, oh, my gosh, Caitlin, quick. I'm on the edge of my seat. How does God reveal himself to us? Okay, well, that's something we're going to look at in the next episode. So that's it from me from this episode. Thanks for sticking with me and I will see you in episode three. Bye. Bye.